Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Uh, my name is Jared. I'm a recovered alcoholic. Thanks, uh, thanks so much, you guys, for having me here to speak with you. It's uh, <clears throat> always an honor and a privilege to get invited to speak anywhere, especially across the pond, um, <clears throat> even if it is on Zoom and in my garage. <laughs> so I get uh, I'll start my timer here just in case. Oh, it looks like it's synced up pretty good. So <clears throat> I'm going to talk, uh, you know, I look back at my life and, you know, I picked this topic because something that, that, you know, I live my life, right? Live my life playing God. Um, really, this whole thing is about step three. But <clears throat> before that, I let me give you guys a little history. I, I did the one, two, three shuffle for about 10 years in and out of the rooms, but, but really I, I never made it past, past step one. You know, I, I had no idea what I was up against. Um, <clears throat> you guys know that, that uh, end portion of how it works, you know, where everybody robotically chants the last line together, you know, and, and I did that for years and I had no, I had no idea about what it meant or what I was supposed to do or anything. And, and I mean, for even a good portion of that time, I wasn't even sure if I was an alcoholic. I mean, you guys are the ones that, that, that helped me find my truth so that I could diagnose myself. <clears throat> and I think about that, like even that whole passage, you know, even right before the ABCs, the description of the alcoholic, right? Really, really the description of the alcoholic, it's defined on, on, on pages 20 to 22, you know, the the moderate, the hard, and the real alcoholic, and it ends by saying something like this description should identify him roughly. You know, step, step two in, in we agnostics and my own experience, drunk and sober, have led me up to this point. So basically, am I convinced without a shadow of a doubt that drunk or sober, I'm an alcoholic and I can't manage my own life on my own power no, no matter what I've tried, that that probably no human power can relieve my alcoholism, no matter how great the need, the the want, the necessity, any of that stuff. And and I have to ask myself these questions, these considerations, right? Is there anything else that I can do that I haven't tried yet? And and I found for me, if if there is, I haven't run out of alternatives yet, because really I have to get down to two die an alcoholic death or live life on a spiritual basis. So, so when, when there's, when there's nowhere left for me to go and I have, and I have no other option except, you know, I have to believe that God can and will. And that's the only option left for a guy like me. You know, I, I never had a problem with, with canny, but will God do it for, for somebody like me? I mean, you don't know my history, you know, the, the, the original manuscript talks about if you're not convinced on these on these vital issues, you ought to reread the book up to this point because because I've dodged something. I don't want to look at something. I, I'm I'm not really in it to win it, and I'm not really willing to let go of of my life run on my will. And it says all that stuff, and it says, well, if it's it comes to that point, either you know either you know, throw it away, just throw the book away if I'm not convinced. But then it says, if I am convinced, I'm now at step three. And which is where I'm going to turn my will, which is my thinking and my life, which is my action over over to the care of God, as I now understood him, right? And, and I love that word decision, because it means that 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 word means I've just had all my other options cut away. All my alternatives are gone. And this is what's left. This is my, like, I'm out of options, right? So I look at that, right? If I'm an alcoholic and I've got this, this, this hopeless state of mind and body, I can't stop once I started and, and I can't keep myself from starting again. I can't manage my life successfully and I can't find 
something, anything that'll keep me happy and, and, and content and sober long enough to not go back to drinking. My, my, my emotional nature and emotions are all over the place and no human power can relieve me of this. There's, there's no alternatives. I'm done. I've just had all my other options cut away and there's nothing left for me to seek the help of God, of a power greater than myself. Right. And, and I'm resistant, right? Because one of, the, one of the biggest things we talk about in the rooms in the, of Alcoholics Anonymous, but not in the book, is we have to you know, surrender. So, and I'm like, surrender what? You know, what am I surrendering here? It's, I'm surrendering my judgment. You know, when I, when I turn my will over to God, I'm turning over my judgments. Because what are most of my thoughts? I don't know if you guys are like me. Most of my thoughts are judgments. My judgment's the thing that's, that's making me all go all over the place. It's making me run by self-propulsion, like the book talks about, trying to, to c- control and possess other people. That's why I'm always at ends with everybody. That's why I'm unhappy, even with all of my good motives, right? And and the big book covers this in just absolute amazing detail on pages 60 to 62. And it says each person's like the actor who wants to run the whole show is forever trying to arrange the lights, the ballet, the the scenery, um, uh, your wife or husband, the in-laws or parents, the people at work in, in my own way. Now, now, if only my arrangements would stay put if only all you guys would do what i wanted the show would be great i would be happy but you know what wait wait you know what you would be happier too if you did things my way because i know what's best for everybody right life life would be wonderful if all you guys would only behave and my sponsor had me read that portion of the book over and over and over and over for a long time and I'd have some of my guys do it too. And, and I would read this portion, this, this section, and, and, and I, I couldn't see that I'm that way. I could see how all you guys are doing it, how, all, how you guys were the actor trying to run the whole show. But, but when I'm doing that, I, I, I couldn't see it in me, right? Because we're always quick to see, see the defects of character in, in others before we're able to see them in ourselves. Now, I mean, I could see you guys doing it. And, and, and I could, you know, I could be um, doing the exact same thing. I'm not trying to run the show. I'm just trying to make it comfortable for everybody and make it nice because I always think I'm right. So, so why, why do I keep having problems in my life? You know, why are, why are things not going my way? Well, the big book comes right out and tells me it's because I'm selfish and self-centered. You know, it, and, and it says that we think is the root of our trouble, not a root. It is the root of the alcoholic's trouble. That's what the book says, because me, I always need to maintain control and, and, and create this illusion of power so I can be okay, right? I'm driven by all this fear. The book talks about a hundred forms of fear, right? The lies that I'm telling myself, this, this, unquenchable insatiable need to for for all of you guys to provide me with happiness and validation feelings that that i just don't i'm not good enough i don't i don't ever really measure up right feeling sorry for myself and and in my attempt to avoid feeling like this to avoid all this stuff i make a mad dash for the stuff that i think i need to be okay and what happens i step on your toes sometimes i don't even know it I'm going so fast, I'm running over you so fast, I don't even notice that you were there, right? But, but then when you turn around and you snap back and you hurt me, why'd you do that? Why, 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 why'd you hurt me? I didn't, uh, you know, I, I, I didn't see what I did. And I think, I think that you're lashing out on me or, 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 or trying to get over on me. But I realized that sometime in the past, you know, I'm the guy who made decisions, you know, that, that I was only thinking about Jared watching out for Jared with no regard for, for anything or anybody else. I made decisions based on what I thought I needed to be okay, uh, to be, to be fulfilled, which later, maybe even today, right now, p- place me in a position to be hurt. But I, I can see it that way. Right. But 99% of my troubles of my problems of my, my, 
not enoughness, my problems of lack of power, they're products of my own mind. I created them. They come from within me. Why, right? That's the question. Because I'm trying to run my, my life on my own will. When, when I, I keep trying to go back to my thinking mind, right? The thing that caused my problems to solve them. It's never going to work. I mean, I get told by you guys, no, stop. Stop playing God. It's not working. You know, st- take a step back. Pump the brakes. You've de- You've burned it to the ground already. And I mean, that's what the book says. The book, and and you guys even may, I don't know what the meetings are like over there across the pond, but sometimes we'll hear people in meetings over here talking about, well, I don't know how this thing works, but it does. You know, it's like, so in the book, it talks about this is the how and why of it. This is how it's going to work and why, right? It says, first, we had to quit playing God. Well, that's how, that's how it's going to work. But why would I do that? You know, I look at my own experience on, on my life run on my power with the best of intentions going as hard as I possibly can to control and manage everything around me like I usually do. And what do I find? <sighs> Wasn't working very well. And, and it's funny how, how God will will send it send God sends me little tests to see where I'm at spiritually, you know, to see if I'm really doing this as a way of life. And a couple months ago, I just had one of these kind of one of these experiences is, and it's like, I was working with somebody who just who who would not see our way of life. And I remember very vividly, because this guy's fighting me on everything. And it was like looking into a mirror for myself of 15 years ago, right? Because I never thought I was playing God, especially when I was out there or brand new or whatever. You know, I've, 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 I've been living my whole life this way because really who, who knows better about what, what I want, what's going to make me happy, what my life is supposed to look like better than me. Right. I, I can't rely on anybody else to take care of me or give me what I think I need to feel okay and satisfied and happy. Right. I mean, I've had a pretty gnarly life, jail, state prison, countless rehabs. I was on the street, homeless on, on paper for almost 10 years. You know, I developed and, 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 and honed these survival and, and, and defense mechanisms to keep myself safe and get what I needed to get, you know, and, and after all that time, I'm still alive. And that was all the proof that I needed to convince myself that it was working because really when you guys are just stop playing God, stop playing God, you know, more God, this and that. And it's like, well, what experience did I really have with God? Nothing. I didn't have any experience. And that became apparent, apparent to me. I looked at some of my early inventories, right? And it's full of like people, uh, you know, people who are just not about it, right? People at work who were, who were stealing or who just didn't care about the job. Um, guys in the treatment facility I was at, you know, not doing their chores right or, or being disrespectful when I'm trying to do something, right? The my, people in the meetings that I'm going to that, were, that I know them and they're lying you know, when they're sharing or, or they're just there trying to hook up with the newcomers, right? And I took all this stuff, all these sheets, all this resentment inventory with stuff like this. And I go to my sponsor and he lay in, and I'm reading it and he says, you got to stop playing God. I'm all, what do you mean? He said, you got to stop playing God in everybody else's life. I said, no, this is like, I see this stuff happening. I see the people stealing at work. I mean, I, these people just total BS in the meetings or they're just there to get the new blah, 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 all this stuff. And, and all I was doing, I didn't see it at the time I was separating myself. You know, my judgment had separated me from all of you guys. And, it, you know, I, I did this my whole life because I was stuck in the delusion that, I, that it was going to change, that, I, that it was going to work. Now, I mean, maybe some of you guys are like me. May, like, I, I would always have this internal struggle going on all the time. Secretly, deep down, I feel insecure, inadequate, separate, overall, just like, just like a piece of crap, right? But outside, my ego is going to pump itself up and project itself outward that, that I'm big and bad and I have to compensate for all this all this, this inadequacy and this fear and this, this inferiority complex that I have. Right. And, and I mean, I could, 
I could sound good, right? I can sound confident and self-assured and I can, I can totally conceal this fact that inside I feel this way, but, but it's like, I felt somehow that it, like, if I brought you down or insulted you, you know, I would feel better about myself. I would knock you down. Right. And, and I would be able to keep the upper hand and, and it never worked. Because my judgment and me doing all this stuff, it just separates me more, right? I push you away because of my actions. And, and I find myself not only without the people that I think I need to be okay, but now, now I'm alone. Now, now I have to go, go and, and try and start this whole process you know, again. And after I've, I've successfully alienated you from my life, you know, that only that only makes this feeling that I have inside me that something's wrong. It just, it gets bigger, right? And that makes my ego inside compensate, push harder, makes me want to judge you more. And now, so I can feel better about myself. And then that only makes me more separate. And the whole cycle starts over and over and over. And I'm trapped. I'm trapped in this thing. And, and I noticed the same thing. Well, it was pointed out to me that, that my self-worth and my ego or my, my, what do you call it? My sense of self are opposites, right? You guys can think of like a, like a seesaw, you know, the kids playground equipment, you know, one kid sits on either side of a fulcrum and it goes up and down. My, when my self-worth is really low, my ego needs to puff itself up and, 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 and compensate. When it's low, that's when I'm the most driven for acceptance and validation. That's when I go out and, and frivolously spend that's when i act out sexually that's when i go looking for likes on social media that's when i need the attention that's when i don't know that's when i assassinate your character that's when i'm unforgiving that's when i that's when i have the most judgment that's when i had never have enough money or enough stuff right but on the opposite side the opposite side of the spectrum you know it's at certain times in recovery my self-worth and my self you know and my self-esteem is really high and my ego is really low, you know, working with others, making amends, being a service, you know, like doing esteemable acts, right? And then when I do those things, I feel good. And I don't, and I see that I don't need anything out here to, to produce that feeling, right? You know, I don't, I don't need the validation because I'm really okay inside. I'm not, you know, you, I'm not judging you and you're not bothering me. And my entire life, I looked out here to status or material possessions or people to be okay. And I was wrong. Right. And I never would have thought to go inward and do this stuff that doesn't make any sense, like help somebody else or do esteemable acts or work with a newcomer, stuff like that. I got that from you guys, you know, and, and I mean, my, my life was a roller coaster for, for a long time. And I just, I just wanted it to level out. Right. And I never thought I never thought it would it would work. I never thought I'd be able to to like my emotions would always be all over the place, right? But you know, when I'm sick, I constantly try and run the show and play God so I can feel okay inside. You know, I I cannot wrest satisfaction and happiness out of this world like just by managing well. It doesn't work. I mean, that's why the, the book is amazing. It's like, I've never put it, been able to put like, like, a, like this thought together. And I see it, I'm all, oh my God, this, that's exactly what I'm going through. Right. But, you know, by, I can't do it by arranging the world and all of you guys to, to get what I want. I, I think I need to be happy. But when I, when I truly surrender my life to God and, and, and God gets to decide who's in my life, where I work, how much money I make, what I do, who, who I sponsor, what my life looks like, the results are better than I ever could have planned, right? But this whole thing, it's, um, it's like looking back in the rear view mirror. It's a looking back experience because I'm almost never able to see the, 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 the hand of God in my life when I'm in the middle of something. Um, it's like, it's like you can look at it like when you're when you're demolishing a house or you're remodeling a house, right? Me, I like, oh, well, yeah, we're going to demolish this house. We're going to rebuild it. Okay, cool. Well, I want the blueprint. I want the floor plan. So 
I want this so so I can review it. I can approve or disapprove, you know, the, all the details. I want to make changes. I want to make sure everything's to my liking, but it doesn't work that way. God doesn't do that. God just starts tearing stuff out, right? And I start to get afraid because God didn't give me the floor plans to look at. Now, I mean, I, I look back in, in my own experience and I can see very clearly where God, where, where God was in my life. But, you know, when, you know, looking back, but I couldn't see it when it was happening. A good story. I think about a good story. I always think about this one. <clears throat> I had this girlfriend. I was, you know, we're, we're dating and we're, I'm, I'm real into her and everything. And we've been dating for a little while. And then one day gone, no contact ghosted me. No, like not, you know, not returning phone, uh, phone calls, not answering the phone, no text, nothing. You know, I'm being the creeper and I'm going over where she was, not there, nothing. And, and around the same time, I remember I had this job, you know, I, I really liked it. I was doing well at it, you know, and they told me, that, you know, after my 90 day review, um, you know, I'd be making a more live, uh, livable wage, we can call it. Well, you know, that review came and went and no extra money was offered or anything. And, you know, and I had to, I had to quit that job and go back to the, you know, telemarketing, telephone sales industry to be able to pay my bills. Right. And all this stuff is, is happening in my life. Right. And I'm afraid, you know, and, and I'm like, God, I want to know why this is happening. Why, God, why are you doing this to me? I'm like, I liked how my life was going before. I was, I was, I was comfortable. I don't, I don't like this kind of change, right? This stuff's happening and, and, and I'm afraid, you know, and it hurt. And i I wanted to know what God had in store for me. So I don't know. So I could be okay. And, and God, again, God doesn't do that. God just starts removing things from my life that don't line up with God's plan. And I got no say in what I thought it should look like. You know, personally, personally, I wanted God to come down or come down from above right there in front of me on, in, on the couch and say, look, Jared, I know you're going through it right now, but, but I had to get that girl out of your life. She's getting loaded behind your back. You know, if you stay with her, you're going to relapse and die. You know, and, and you know what, Jared, I've got a lot more for you to do for me in this life. You know, would, would it be all right if I, if I removed her from your life so you could go over here and grow spiritually for a bit while a woman that you love, who you've got a history with, can get her life together and get sober and you two can get married and build a beautiful life and family together? Would, would that be okay with you, Jared? Would that be okay if I, if I did that? Oh, yeah, of, of course. And look, and look, Jared, I had to get you out of this, that, that job. I want God to say this, right? I, that job was a dead end for you. I need you to go over here for a few months and be able to take care of some of the stuff, you know, with your, with your past and your background. So I can, you know, so you can get into, into this career with the federal government doing what you, what you love. So you can go to work every day with a, with a sense of purpose and, and, and have the opportunity to make six figures and, and support yourself and your family. Would, would that be cool if I did that? <laughs> of course, God. If you're going to put it down like that, I mean, yeah, of course, but he doesn't do that. You know, he, God doesn't let me see the floor plan, and I just need to trust. But if I'm constantly trying to play God in my life, none of this stuff would have ever showed up. I would still be out there trying to control and, and, and run my life and get whatever I think I need to be happy. But the funny part about it is that, that looking back at my own experience, I have, I mean, I'm always out there like, oh, I need this or, oh, I need this. This will make me have this. It's like at my, looking at my own experience, I've, I have no clue what really, you know, what's really going to make me happy. Because if I look at it, even if after I get the stuff or, or the, the notoriety or the money, you know, the, the shine wears off of it and I'm, I'm left with me still feeling less than and, and looking for what's this next thing that's going to be able to make me happier that I think I need to be okay. And I need, I need to establish and build and grow this relationship with God so I can stop playing God. Now, I mean, I look at it like this, 
this new blissful, amazing relationship that I just got into. That's not God. That new car that I just got. Oh, I look at my new car. That's not God. That money, the, the job, none of that stuff is God. No human power, no thing can relieve me of this, this obsession to drink or use or whatever or control and manage my own life. All of that stuff only provides a, a temporary satisfaction and it's usually fleeting. It's gone, right? Oh, I just got this. I just got into this new relationship and now I can, I can straighten up and behave and, and, and everything will be good. And then, and honeymoon phase is over and I'm on to the next next one you know and uh you know oh i just got this new truck out there everybody see it oh it's great i feel so good now you know now the shine just wore off of the uh you know from from the truck and now i'm a guy who has a brand new truck outside who feels empty inside what what's up with this right i i got i i get this great job and and if i do good you know i'm gonna i'm gonna keep making money and then then the money gets old. Now it's, it's something else. You know, I'm, I'm not satisfied. No human power can help me, but God can and will. I mean, so I got to look at like, what is my current relationship with God look like right now today? And I mean, I always like to get everybody involved, reg regardless of time away from a, from a drink or whatever your, your uh, drug of no choice is, you know, how does your relationship with God look today, right now? You know, if, if I have unfinished amends that I could be making today that wouldn't cause more harm, and I have them over here on the back burner, I'm hurting that relationship with God, even though I don't think so because it's out of sight and out of mind and I'm playing God in my life because, Oh, I want to make them on my own time. Right. When, you know, where, where am I experiencing fear in my life currently? You know, and I mean, I can talk about the, the current level of agnosticism and whatnot playing out in, in, in my life, you know, because secretly, you know, I don't think God's going to work here. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm stuck on self-reliance because I need something to be a certain way. I want something to be a certain way. I'm playing God. You know, if, if I'm, if I'm resentful at you for um, anything, pretty much some un, unmet need that I have that didn't, that you didn't do something that I thought you should have according to my plan or whatnot, I'm playing God. You know, I don't think, I don't think they could have had put a more accurate d definition of how I play God in my life than the one that they used in the big book. I mean, like it says, I'm like the actor who wants to run the whole show, forever arranging, managing, controlling to be my way, right? And I have to be convinced based on, on my own experience that no matter what I try, no matter, I mean whatever angle I've got or how I slice it or anything, me playing God in my life is not successful. And, and I got to get rid of these alternatives. That's the only thing that's going to work, right? I have to be convinced that my life run on my will can hardly be a success. And I mean, that's, that's a hard thing for me to be convinced of, you know, and it's, it's the same thing as me thinking that, that I could control my drinking when I was out there. It's the same thing as me trying to think I can manage and control my life and wrest satisfaction out of my life. Right. And, you know, because the problem was that when I was like, when I was drinking there, there were a lot of times that it worked out that, that, you know, I was doing, I was doing bad stuff, but I got away with it. Right. And I would have fun and, and, and everything would be cool. But, and then even years after that, even when it stopped working, I would look back at those times that it was working and I would think, you know, it's going to be like that again. And I do the exact same thing with trying to play God in my life and run my own life. But the, the funny thing about that is when, was when you run your life on self-will, I mean, sometimes it just works out. 
just but totally by chance it works out and i remember my sponsor told me he saw now pump the pump the brakes there jared even a broken clock is right twice a day it doesn't mean that you can successfully run your own life but me i go and i focus on on the times that it worked out and i totally you know cast aside and and disregard the hundreds of times that it got me depressed and alone just feeling like a piece of crap and i and and i would be positive that i can run my own life and that's why for me it's hard to be convinced i need to surrender my inability to 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 try and control and manage my own life and that's when i really quit playing god and and when how do i know that's happened right how do i know when that's happened with this this moment that that i think is I don't know, weakness, probably, I finally run out of alternatives. And I'm faced the, the uh, you know, I have to face the fact that no matter what I try, I cannot fix me. And then it brings me right there. It's decision time again, right? But this time, I'm going to decide that God is going to be my director, that I'm the actor, I play the role that God assigns me. But I mean, it's easy to say and pay lip service to but you know, what does that look like in my life? <clears throat> that it means, you know, uh, who's in my life, uh, where I work, you know, the amount of money that I make, where I go, who I sponsor, all that stuff. It's not up to me anymore because all of my attempts to control and, and manage all that stuff left me wanting more. How am I supposed to act like an actor or, or an agent or a child when all that I know is to try and run the show? And excuse me, the uh, a, a really great practice that I started with was to start bringing God into everything that I do. Just, just, just to make that conscious contact, right? Just trying to to you know think of God more often in my regular activities, considering or 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 asking God, what should I do here? You know, how should I think about this, and not not reacting that was the biggest thing for me um work for me is always a, a really easy um area for me to see my a lot of my third step experiences you know probably because that's that's where i still try and control or or run the show and 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 will things into action right um looking back I, I I'd just gone through this process for, for the first time, right? And I'm barely starting to wake up to this stuff. Um, eight or nine years ago, I'm I'm working at this job and I'm going to school, right? It's more or less like a entry level position. And and the company that I was with, they've been, you know, they've been promising me uh, you know, more money after this, you know, or better wage whatever it is after the 90 day review and i'd get bumped up well again that came and went no change so i i approached the boss and i asked him for you know se several dollars less you know than what i thought i was worth at the time and then it was like i don't know 18 to 20 dollars an hour or something <clears throat> so we're talking and he said well you know i'm and he said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, we're just not in the position to be able to do that, you know, right at, at this time. And he must have seen the look on my face because he said, well, does that mean you're, are you going to start looking for another job now? And I just looked at him. And I said, well, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. I got to take it to meditation. Just like that. I'm sure, he gave me a weird look. But um, I went home that night and, and I turned to God, right? Got on my knees the this this little buffer of financial aid that i had was about to run out you know and um i mean i had bills to pay i mean i needed to pay rent everything and i honestly asked god i said god what am i supposed to do you know should i should i stay at this job and and wait it out and you know chance then them bumping me up to where I'm, i need to be or should i look for something else what am i supposed to do god i need i need some guidance and direction so the next day, not even 24 hours later, I get a call from one of my friends. I, I mean, I haven't talked to this guy in, in, I don't know, close to a year. Calls me up out of the blue. He goes, oh, well, what's up, Jared? How's it going? You working? You still doing the machining thing? You know, how's that going? 
And I said, well, honestly, um, my employer can't pay me what I need to pay my bills. I'm probably going to have to start looking for another job. And he says, looks like I called you at the right time. Now, he's a good sales guy. You know, we used to work together doing sales. And he says, why don't you come work with me? I'm all, ooh, uh, I don't know. I don't know about going back to sales, man. Fear, right? Grow in understanding and effectiveness. God literally brought this to me right after I prayed about it. Do I trust God? Can I turn this over? So he, my friend says, like, come on, come on, man. I know you can do this. You'll be working directly with me, and I'll start you out at 24 bucks an hour. Okay, so put in my two weeks notice the next day. <clears throat> now, I mean, I, I stayed there for a bit, but, but really that job was like a, a, a segue into, into, to, for me to get into where I'm at now. It'll, it allowed me to take care of, of um, all the stuff that I needed to do, you know, in the meantime, which was a long process. So when I, when I think about it, when I really look back in the rear view mirror of experience at, at this, this third step experience that really, I guess, let me step from bridge to shore, like it talks about in the book. This one always comes to mind. I mean, <clears throat> we think about it, it's, it's great. It's great when everything works out the way we want it to, and it's, and it's smooth and seamless, and, and you know, it's a great transition, and we just get to step back and watch God do what he does, and, and it's amazing, right? But, and I'm sure a lot of people on here have had that experience, and, and that's all good, but what about when it's not? What about when it doesn't happen that way? What about <clears throat> when the road's bumpy and, and I'm running into walls and obstacles and, and holes along the way and stuff? So about six, six and a half years ago, <clears throat> I applied for this job that I had absolutely no business applying for with, with my kind of history. I mean, being a multiple felon, I'm a career criminal, I've been to state prison, um, and I went out for this job, and some people that I knew who knew a little bit about my history, they said, why are you even wasting your time? They're, they're never going to hire you, not with your history, but I chose to believe my brothers and sisters in the fellowship who told me, no, you go and do it because God will show up. Um, I, I applied to, to work as a machinist to make aircraft parts for the Department of Defense, you know, the Navy, the federal government that required a, a, a secret government clearance. To, I, I had to be able to obtain and maintain a secret government clearance. So this, during this, this hiring process, you know, they had me, they had me fill out this questionnaire that wanted... It was like 40 pages long, unless you answer yes to certain questions, and then it turns into 50 or 60 pages long. Um, they wanted stuff like um, every address I've ever lived at, phone numbers of people that have known me for you know over 10 years that know me well. Um, the uh, and this little section that asked if I've ever been arrested or had contact with law enforcement. And if so, uh, please explain with uh, dates and contact information and dispositions and all this stuff. I get to this part in, in this questionnaire and I go, oh, my God, I'm, I'm terrified. I had anxiety, right? I'm, I'm, I'm going to pull my hair out. See, it's gone. <laughs> and I mean, I'm thinking at that point, maybe I should just quit. I mean, I, I'm, I'll just go do something else. There's no way. There's no way. This is like, I, I can't do this. They have this little tiny box for me to, you know, for me to try and explain this. I mean, but you guys, you guys taught me to be 100% honest and truthful. So I'd gone out before that. And I, you know, I had the, 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 uh, in, the uh, intuitive thought to go get a live scan, you know, where they scan your fingerprints and it gives you a, a printout of everything, you know, anybody who's going to look you up is going to see. And I ended up typing this 
nine page live scan that I had into this little tiny box. And I mean, terrified, shaking, I'm all, oh, this, this isn't going to work out. But there was, there was something inside me driving me and <clears throat> just saying, just, just keep going, keep going. It's like, cause what do I have to lose? Right. And then what happened? They moved me to the next process and the next and the next and the next. And then I got this email with the formal job offer and a start date. Show up to this military base on this day and time, right? Oh my God, it's a miracle. I, I, I couldn't believe it, right? Neither could my sponsor. I call my sponsor and I'm like hysterical. And, and he said, oh my gosh, you, you must be one of God's favorites because that kind of stuff never happens for me. The, amazing, God, like what a blessing. So <clears throat> I get this email, right? And I, and I quit my job with short notice because the way the government works, it's like, oh, you do what we say now and then whatever. So I show up on the day, right? <clears throat> the process to get on a military base, in case you guys don't know, is you pull up, you pull up to the sentry at the, at the gate, who's usually armed with a machine gun. Uh, you show them your military ID. They look at you. They look at the ID. They look back at you. They scan the ID, and they, you know it beeps, and then they they wave you through. Well, I show up, and I I don't have a military ID, so you know I pull up and I show them my driver's license, and and. Uh, this the formal job offer that I printed out in lar the largest font that I could, and they looked at it and they said, "Oh, you you have you have to go over here to the pass and ID office and 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 uh, and get a get a pass so you can come on the base." Oh, okay, it's just outside the base over there. Okay, turn around, got to wait a little bit, you know, because they're not open yet. And they open up and I go inside and I'm waiting in line because there's already a line, <clears throat> and you know, then it's my turn. I go up to the counter. You know, and I, I, I hand them the letter and I slap down my, my uh, driver's license on the, on the counter with pride, right? Like, I made it. I did it, right? I'm here. And, and they say, oh, okay, they look at the letter and they say, okay, go ahead and, uh, and place your, your finger on the fingerprint scanner. Okay. Put on the fingerprint scanner and it beeps, right? And, and the lady behind the counter, she looked at me and she looks down and she goes, oh, um, I'm sorry, this says you can't even come on this base with an escort. Fear. But, what? But, but, but the letter, the letter, and she says, I'm, I'm sorry, you'll have to get a waiver. You know, um, here, here, call this number, and, and they'll give you a calendar day to go in front of the security board. Oh, what now? Can, can I really turn my will, which is my thinking, and my life, which is my actions, over to this power, they're going to judge me by my past. I look bad on paper. So I don't know what to do. I went to past employers. I went to friends. I went to my family and in, in, in the fellowship asking for help, right? Letters of character reference. You know what? That, that's a hard thing to do. I don't know if any of you guys have ever went to people that you know and asked them for character reference letters. What do people really think of me? You know? I got a couple, I sent them five or six letters and they said, okay, you know, I sent them in and they review them on this day and time and, and for me to call afterwards. I say, okay, I wait for that. You know, the time goes by. So I call them. Now, this is a, this is Jared Shine on my, I'm, I'm following up on, on my clearance. And they say, oh, let me check. It was denied. Can, what do I do? God, can, can, can I appeal it? And they said, yeah, yeah, yeah you can appeal it. We'll, we'll set another date. I'm afraid. Can I do this? I'm afraid. God says, no, don't be. Go back. Keep going. And that's, that's when all you guys came forward with, with these, these, these powerful letters full of, of heartfelt love and compassion, community spirit. I, I always thought I was a tornado roaring my way through people's lives. And now I get to see, see some of my closest friends talk about how they watched me turn my life around. Call me a mentor. See me help others and give back to the greater community. And I remember I asked my wife, Megan, if I thought, you know, I'm looking for people, you know, like owners of businesses, you know, high standing, stuff like that. Nice letterheads. And I asked, I asked my wife's dad, I'm, or I asked her, I'm like, hey, you think your dad would, uh, would write me a letter? You know, he's a business owner and whatnot. And she goes, 
I'm sure he would, but, but you should ask my brother. He was in the Navy. I said, oh, that's right. What, what was his rank? And she goes, um, I don't know. I think it was pretty high, though. He was a commander. He gave me an exceptional reference. So I, I send in all these letters, right, with his on top. Make this one priority so they see it first, right? Call on this day and time. Okay. So I call. You know, checking on the on my status, my clearance. We're going to check. They denied it again. Now what? Another appeal? All I keep going. Don't stop. Fear crops up. I'm afraid. Can I trust this power? You know, men of faith of men of, men of faith have courage. They trust their God. You guys know what courage means? Courage is defined as the ability to do something that frightens one. So, so after they denied me the second time. I reach back out to my brother-in-law, right? And, I, and I'm talking to him about it. He says, wow, that's, that's a bummer, man. I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. And we're talking. <clears throat> and I'm telling him the base that I'm trying to get on and whatnot. And, and he goes, <clears throat> let, let me check out how God works in my life when I trust and turn it over and stop trying to play God, right? So we're talking and I'm telling him what base it, it is and everything like that. And he's now, he's a thousand miles away from me up, up California. And he goes, you know what? I think I actually know the commander of the base that you're trying to get on. We used to fly jets together. They were fighter pilots. He said, let me see if I can get a message to him. So the next day he sends me their correspondence, right? And, and the commander of that base says, he says, I recognize your name on the, on, on the top letter. So we spent an extra long time on my case. There was, there was something that, that, that in my past that made them a, the, uh, vote a no on my, on, my whole, on my whole case, on my access, right? So he, told, he said for me to come back with, with an explanation of the past 10 years and, and some more letters of character. And he said, and he said, we didn't see a personal letter of character from, from Jared. And he said, then we can reevaluate. Talk, talk about trying to turn it over to God to write those letters. So how, how do you explain almost 10 years of criminal behavior and drug addiction and alcoholism to, to the military, right? Bring God in, turn it over do the disciplines, trust the power, right? A lot of emotions flowed as I'm, as I tried to describe to a team of military security professionals, how my darkest past has now, has now become my greatest resource and, and ask, and, and asking them to set aside the questionable behavior of, of a criminal drug addict, alcoholic, and rather look at the man that I've become today because of God in this program. So I sent them in, I submitted the letters, right? And I experienced this very strange sensation. Suddenly, it didn't matter if they approved it or not. Suddenly, my whole life and my whole sense of well-being wasn't riding on their approval. All of a sudden, I had the feeling of being taken care of. And, and I know that, that, that regardless of whatever the outcome God had something great in store for me, and I felt at ease. So they approved my security clearance and my access to the base. So I'm now the leader of the shop that I work at in a, in a semi-supervisory capacity because that's the role that God assigned me. You know, and, and I share that story not, not only to show the results of trust and reliance on God, but also to give a message of hope to anybody out there who thinks that their past is too dark that the obstacles are, are just too great, or, or no, no, you don't know what I've been through. So I'm here to tell you that God makes a way where there is no way. Abandon yourself to God, surrender, turn, turn everything over to this power, let go of the outcome and watch God put you exactly where you're supposed to be to serve him. And it, the, even the book says, when we took such a position, remarkable things followed. We had a new employer being all powerful. God provided what we needed. As long as I do two things, if I cl kept close to God and I performed his work well, and in doing those two things, some incredible stuff starts to happen. I start to be less interested in me. 
what everybody can do for me, right? And I start looking for, for how I could be a good servant, how I can add to the stream of life about how I can trust God. And I start to wake up and I get to see that I'm not a piece of garbage, that I, that I can be useful to somebody else, that, that life can work out and I can have a nice piece of it too, because I'm not trying to control anymore. And that's what really takes me from bridge to shore, from, from this belief in a power to an actual trust in God. And that is how I stop playing God. My name is Jared. I'm a recovered alcoholic. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.